Hello and welcome to the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty's third webinar in the uh, Data-Driven Justice Initiative series. Uh, today's focus is on housing law and policy, uh, specifically on preventing homelessness by protecting renters. <coughs> uh, go ahead, Janelle. Uh, today we've got an excellent panel of um, very uh, knowledgeable experts. Um, uh, my colleague here at the Law Center, Tristia Bauman, um, another senior attorney at Community Legal Services in East Palo Alto, um, California, um, and John Pollock, who's the coordinator of the National Coalition for Civil Right to Counsel. Um, we'll all be doing short presentations and then um, picking up at the end uh, with some questions and answers. Uh, next slide, Janelle. Uh, during the webinar, um, you will be muted. Um, but uh, you can type questions in the chat box on the side of the screen. Uh, you can see it highlighted here uh, in the, the graphic. Uh, you can also, at the end of the webinar, uh, use the hand raise function, uh, the little circle in the graphic, uh, to raise your hand and you'd be able to ask the questions orally. Um, uh, but we'll, uh, So you can type in questions at any point during the, the uh, presentation and uh, some of them, if, if we can, we'll answer in the, the course of the presentation, but probably uh, the majority of them we'll, we'll leave to the end and, and do them all at once. Um, uh, so with that brief introduction, I'll hand over to Janelle to uh, start us off with a couple of polls. Hi, everyone. This is Janelle Fernandez at the Law Center. Uh, we just wanted to ask you to participate in a couple of interactive polls with us. This will just take a second. And so what you'll see appearing on your screen is an interactive poll window. You can uh, click right into the window to give us your answer. And we'd like to know how familiar are you with renter protections in your community? Uh, if you could just rate your level of familiarity, very familiar, somewhat familiar, or not at all familiar. And we'll give folks just a few more seconds to respond. You can just click right into the window and it'll record your reply. Okay, great. So let me share those results with you. So everyone who responded so that they are somewhat familiar with runner protections in your community. So that's great. You have um, some basis of knowledge there and hopefully we can expand upon that today. And we're going to ask one more quick question of you. And this, uh, this question, you can select multiple answers if you're familiar with, uh, if you're aware of, um, you know, multiple laws in your community. So we'd like to know if your community has or is considering any of the following types of laws, uh, laws pr protecting renters and foreclosed properties, rent stabilization, just cause eviction laws, eviction record sealing and expungement laws, or uh, right to counsel in housing cases. Um, so again, you can select multiple, and you can just click right into that poll window, and we'll record your responses there. And I'll just give folks a little bit more time to respond. All right. Thank you, everyone. So let me share these results with you. About a quarter of the folks that responded um, are aware of rent stabilization efforts in their community, of just cause eviction laws, and of right to counsel in housing cases. So good to know that um, those are some of the situations that are happening in the communities that we're talking to here today. So thank you all for um, sharing that information with us. We'll have one final closing poll uh, as we near the end of our webinar today. But for now, I'm going to hand it over to Tristia Bauman. Thank you, Janelle. Hello, everyone. My name is Tristia Bauman. I'm a senior attorney at the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. <clears throat> and this is the third in our webinar series for the Data Driven Justice Initiative. And I want to start off with uh, you know, a basic question. Why do we care about renters' protections? How is this relevant to the effort to eliminate uh, the high usage among uh, so many members of the population in these high cost systems. And the reason why is that renter protections are critical for preventing and reducing homelessness. 
uh, it is fairly intuitive to understand that loss of rental housing causes homelessness, particularly in the modern era. We've talked before in some of our webinars, but I'll remind everyone what you likely already know, and that's housing affordability is uh, no longer a fact of life, and in fact, there are only 31 affordable and available units for every 100 families who are extremely low income in this country. That leaves 69 families vulnerable to homelessness either because they're paying more than they can afford for housing or because they simply cannot afford housing in the private market and are left uh, to live in our shelters or on our streets. Part of the reason that housing affordability uh, is so is in a crisis now is because of the historically low vacancy rates uh, that are experienced in so many cities, particularly uh, those tight market cities where vacancy rates for all units, affordable and uh, higher income units, uh, are 3% or less. And among those, uh, and because of the increased competition, rents are continuing to rise at a rapid pace, over 3% annually, uh, which is the largest annual increase since the 1960s. And you see a lot of increased competition for those rates, which of course contributes to the rising rents, but also makes it difficult for people who may have uh, poor credit histories, evictions on their record, criminal records, uh, or low incomes to access the units that are available. One of the reasons why protecting uh, rental renters in rental housing is also because it provides for increased stability. Moving creates, uh, by its own nature, instability in uh, a family's home. It can disrupt employment relationships. It can disrupt uh, child care, schooling. Uh, it requires access to transportation, and as people are pushed further and further out of urban centers where um, most of the public transportation, for example, is available, people who are seeking affordable housing are having to uh, pay more for other expenses, uh, like, for example, transportation costs, in order to afford a roof over their heads. So all of that is to say that renters' protections that can help keep people in homes that are affordable to them now is homelessness prevention. And it is much easier to prevent homelessness now than it is to end it later. Why does that matter to us? It's because preventing homelessness saves money. Next slide, please. So there have been uh, a number of studies, increasing in number over the past 10 years, showing that homelessness is far more expensive to a community than housing people. And the studies that I'll go briefly over here uh, show that housing is the far cheaper option, certainly than criminalizing homelessness, but also than sheltering homeless people, providing transitional housing, permanent housing is the cheapest, most effective option. Nationally, uh, the data shows that chronic homelessness, meaning people who've experienced homelessness for a period of a year or more, uh, costs around $30,000 to $50,000 per person each year. And those are costs borne by various levels of government. A number of studies, as I said, have shown that providing housing to homeless people, whether they be chronically homeless or homeless families, and we've seen a dramatic rise in family homelessness since the inception of the foreclosure crisis in 2007-2008, uh, <clears throat> the studies have revealed that housing people is far cheaper, and in fact, communities that have engaged in housing strategies have realized significant savings because of the reduction in use of those high-cost systems like the criminal justice system and especially the emergency health care system. In Central Florida, for example, a 2014 analysis by the Creative Housing uh, Solutions Group uh, showed that permanent housing, even with case managers, cost about $10,000 per year per person, which was a savings of $21,000 per year for each homeless individual studied. And that would save taxpayers in the Central Florida area $149 million over the course of 10 years. Similar findings were found uh, in a Seattle study uh, in 2009 where they found not only uh, that housing created a 60% decrease 
in emergency medical costs, but also the longer people remained in housing, the greater the savings um, would be and the greater the benefits to the people living in the housing. And so we're talking about real cost savings. Massachusetts, the most recent study that I've listed here, and these are just three from across the country, uh, in 2015 by the Massachusetts Housing and Shelter Alliance, showed that you could save an average of over $9,000 per person by providing housing. Not only do you have significant savings, but again, the longer people remain in housing, the better their overall outcomes and the reduced use of criminal justice system, crisis systems, and emergency health care systems um, that continue to benefit a community over time as people are off the streets. Next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit about a very important uh, lesson that we've learned and that we've learned the hard way uh, and that we are uh, continuing to struggle with as a nation. I did notice that of the people who responded, no one responded that there were any protections for renters and foreclosed properties in your communities. And I'll just walk you through how and why that is a uh, potentially a very costly problem for your community. Uh, the foreclosure crisis, as we're all familiar uh, with, began in some communities in 2007, but really uh, became a national crisis in 2008. And arguably, the foreclosure crisis has been the greatest contributor to new homelessness uh, over the past decade. In fact, 19% of new homelessness is attributable directly to the foreclosure crisis. And that's uh, particularly true of the rise in family homelessness. Uh, we've seen historic levels of increases as it relates to family homelessness. And uh, one measure that we use to uh, demonstrate that historic rise is the count done by the U.S. Department of Education of homeless youth enrolled in U.S. schools. And we've seen a doubling of homeless youth enrolled in our schools today with well over one million, around one and a half million U.S. children who are enrolled in public schools that are counted. So we know that that's an undercount um, and just a fraction of the homeless children who happen to be in school and even more homeless children are below school age. So the foreclosure crisis caused hardship and renters in particular uh, were hit hard. Um, in the discussion surrounding the foreclosure crisis, much attention was paid to homeowners and justifiably so, but the data showed during the foreclosure crisis, 40% of families facing eviction due to foreclosure were renters. And that is because the most vulnerable uh, economic groups tend to be renters. Now, one of the things to think about uh, as it relates to renters in the foreclosure crisis is that they were uh, inherently blameless. They did not contribute to the foreclosure crisis. They had no control over whether or not their homes went into foreclosure. And oftentimes, these renters had valid lease agreements. They were abiding by the terms of their lease. They were regularly paying their rent, but they still were subject to sudden eviction. And why? It's because the laws were not in place to handle a foreclosure crisis um, of a size that the nation had never seen before. Not only were there not laws in place to prevent the crisis from happening, uh, but there were not laws in place at any level of government, federal, state, or local, to address the fallout, particularly as it related to renters. Uh, the Law Center in 2009 uh, issued a report showing that in states across the country, there either were no protections for renters in foreclosed properties because the law did not contemplate that scenario, uh, which would leave their leases vulnerable to uh, sudden termination or leave them vulnerable to immediate, uh, sometimes with as little as three days notice, eviction, lawful eviction, uh, or they uh, had fewer protections than renters who failed to pay their rent or otherwise uh, ab abuse the terms of their lease agreement. In response uh, to the crisis, the federal government enacted a law called the Federal Protecting Tenants at Foreclosure Act, and that provided some basic protections that at that time were not available anywhere in the country under other levels of government. 
One is it provided a minimum of 90 days written notice before someone could be evicted from their home. And while that is a lengthier period of notice than you typically would receive um, as a renter, it was necessary to achieve stability for people who did not know that their rental home was in jeopardy because they were not uh, notified often of a pending foreclosure uh, and, again, had no ability to influence whether or not that foreclosure actually would take place. It also, and this is critical, provided for the survival of bona fide lease agreements post foreclosure. What this means is that if someone who is a genuine renter who is abiding by the terms of their lease and paying their rent on time and has a valid lease agreement gets the benefit of that lease agreement and uh, that contract and can live out the term of their lease agreement, typically a one-year lease agreement, rather than having that suddenly terminated um, and requiring the person to quickly move and attempt to find housing uh, somewhere else in a very tight market um, where there may be few affordable housing units that are near their employment, near their child's school, near where they get their health care. Um, and uh, that type of stability uh, was critically important and was found by uh, housing advocates to be crucial to ensuring housing stability and reducing homelessness among uh, renters who were affected by the foreclosure crisis. Now, unfortunately, that federal law expired in 2014, and while there are uh, and have been in each successive Congress uh, bills that have been introduced to make the federal Protecting Tenants at Foreclosure Act permanent federal law, it is no longer federal law, and the prospects for passage on the Hill um, have not been and do not appear to be good for the future. Next slide, please. So what that means is that, once again, tenants are uh, in the position of having only state and local laws to protect them in the event of foreclosure. And while uh, in the majority of the United States we're past uh, the worst of the current foreclosure uh, or the most recent foreclosure crisis, you do see ongoing effects. One, uh, as we talked about at the beginning of this webinar, as a result of many homeowners losing their homes and being pushed into the rental market, we are seeing historically low vacancy rates where it is competitive to be able to secure a rental unit. Uh, the landlords really have their pick of renters and can impose barriers to access, like, for example, that someone be free from any sort of criminal history, uh, which can disproportionately impact a homeless person who may have been criminalized for their homelessness uh, ability to obtain rental housing. Also, uh, people with evictions on their record, like, for example, all of those innocent renters who had done nothing wrong but found themselves renting in, uh, you know, renting a property where a landlord had defaulted will suffer the consequences of having an eviction on their record. And also rising rents mean that people with low incomes, which is more and more Americans as incomes remain stagnant uh, and do not rise to match the rising cost of housing, cannot meet requirements like, for example, demonstrating that their income is three times the rental amount, <clears throat> which means that uh, it's difficult to find new housing once you have lost the housing that you're in. State and local laws have not made up the difference for the loss of the PTFA. In fact, there are fewer than 15 states across the country with PTFA-like protections uh, and far fewer cities with such protections. So again, the majority of uh, renters are vulnerable to the termination of their otherwise valid lease agreements, regardless of whether or not they are complying with all of the terms of their lease agreements, uh, and also minimal or uh, really no notice before an eviction can be filed against them and before they can be legally and physically removed from their home along with all of their belongings. 
Uh, so that is, again, the current state of the law, and that provides an opportunity for cities to uh, fill the gap and provide some protections for renters and foreclosed properties. Uh, Chicago, Illinois is an example of a city that has enacted that type of protection, uh, and we will see how that type of law, as well as others that promote housing stability, keep people in the homes that they can afford now, uh, can prevent homelessness and save uh, cities money by uh, reducing or for some people eliminating their use of these high cost systems. <clears throat> Uh, and I, I did, and I'll just because it's the last bullet point here, I want to emphasize that an eviction on one's record can create a risk of homelessness because it can make you undesirable to landlords in the private market and make it very difficult for you to compete for fewer and fewer units. What this has meant for some families, particularly uh, in the wake of the foreclosure crisis, is that they simply cannot find housing even if they can afford it. Uh, and have to live in their cars, have to live in emergency shelters, which pushes more and more people out onto the streets. Uh, and we know that communities, particularly in the West, are struggling with um, increasing visible homelessness and a lack of renters' protections contributes to that very thing. Next slide, please. So what can be done? We know that homelessness is expensive. We know that housing is cheaper. We know it's easier to prevent and less costly to prevent homelessness than to solve it once it has occurred. And we know that renters' rights protections are a critical part of homelessness prevention. Well, here are some of the things that you're going to hear about today. Uh, we talked a little bit already about enacting protections of renters and foreclosed properties to ensure that people receive um, at least uh, a uh, period of notice that will help them to have a, a shot at finding alternative housing, safe, adequate alternative housing. Uh, and 90 days was the period of time that was found to be workable under the federal PTFA. And indeed, a lot of uh, large financial institutions have already reformed their policies such that the 90-day period has proven workable. And that is the uh, period that they're operating off of, even in the absence of the federal PTFA. Uh, and so that is the period of time that's recommended, but something longer than the three-day notice that is applicable in so many other jurisdictions. Also, because of the effect of evictions on someone's ability to rent in uh, a, an apartment in the private market sometime in the future after experiencing an eviction, is to permit eviction history sealing and expungement, with, uh, which is something that is not permitted um, or where a legal mechanism to do so does not exist. Um, in, in most of the states in this country. Uh, also, you will hear from our next speaker about rent stabilization and just cause eviction laws and the ways that those laws contribute to uh, a reduction in homelessness and thus a reduction in cost to city governments. And then finally, you'll hear from uh, John Pollock about a right to counsel in housing cases uh, because even the best written laws that can protect renters and help ensure stability in housing uh, are only useful when they can be adequately enforced um, and landlords are often represented, but renters frequently are not, which uh, results in uh, far worse outcomes for renters, even when there may be laws on the books to protect them. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to our next speaker, Daniel Saber. My contact information is here. This webinar is being recorded. You can get all of this information, including these slides, uh, on our website. Dan? Thank you. So can you all hear me all right? Um, I think yes. that the answer is yes. <laughs> Great. Um, perfect. Thank you guys for having me. I'm glad to be able to, to follow up on that, and I appreciate the really wonderful introduction and framing of this. Uh, we can go ahead and move straight on to the next slide. Uh, you can see here, my name is Daniel Saver. I'm a senior attorney at Community Legal Services in East Palo Alto. Um, my office provides free or low cost legal services to lower income residents of San Mateo County, which is the county 
squeeze between San Francisco and San Jose and Silicon Valley. Um, we do both direct services, actually working with vulnerable populations to provide them with legal services, legal representation, such as eviction defense and helping with habitability problems, as well as working with local governments here in our area on policy solutions that can actually try to prevent a lot of the situations that we encounter, um, specifically regarding displacement. So uh, I'll, you see here a roadmap of what we'll cover. So I'll start by describing a little bit of the problem from my perspective as a kind of ground level service provider, uh, and then quickly move through the framework since we touched on that um, in the earlier portion. And then I'll talk about two specific policies, uh, oftentimes which work together, the first being a form of, of rent regulation. So there's a couple of slides on that to give us the overview and kind of the history and evolution and then the kind of 101 on what is this policy. And then moving on to just cause for eviction, similarly describe giving kind of an overview and then talking about some of the basics. And then finally, I'll end with some notes about how these laws are administered, um, which I know is always a concern of local jurisdictions looking to enact these sorts of policies. So we can go ahead and move to the next slide. So uh, Tristia did a great job of describing the problem. Uh, so I want to, before diving into the stuff on the slide, I actually want to just talk a little bit about a, a story of one of the clients that I have worked with that I think illuminates some of these problems. Um, so, you know, this is really focusing on the issue of displacement and people who are forced out of their homes. Um, as I said, we actually represent many lower income tenants here in the Silicon Valley area. I want to tell you a story about one client named Dave, who was a veteran who was lucky enough to win the lottery and get a housing choice voucher or a Section 8 voucher. Uh, Dave had lived in one of the communities here for a number of years. He was relatively close to the uh, medical center where he received medical attention um, through the VA. And uh, Dave lived in about a five unit apartment building. That building was sold to some speculators who immediately issued what are called no cause evictions to all of the tenants, including Dave. So uh, he got an eviction notice saying, you know, you got to leave. Even though you did nothing wrong, you've been paying your rent on time, you've been a perfectly good tenant, but you have to get out. Um, Dave was very fortunate in that because of his connections to the various uh, portions of the social safety net, he had a caseworker from the housing authority who was helping him. He had a social worker from the VA who was also assisting him. And he had me, an attorney, who was working on his behalf. Um, together, we were able to get additional time for Dave to move, but at the end of the day, Dave didn't have a, a legal right to remain in his home. Um, despite the extra time that we had, Dave uh, was unable to, we're in a very tight market here in Silicon Valley, as you might imagine, Dave wasn't able to find an alternative place to live that would take his voucher and that was at a price point that he could afford. Um, so unfortunately, even after the extended time period he had, Dave ended up in a shelter. Um, Unfortunately for Dave, the shelter was quite a distance from the medical center where he received regular attention and he missed a couple of doctor's appointments. He wasn't able to refill his medication and uh, kind of long story short, he deteriorated and ended up leaving the shelter and became homeless and was living on the streets. Um, the last time I was able to speak to Dave, he was unhoused and relatively unstable. Uh, it was very difficult to get a hold of him. In fact, his phone stopped working uh, after that last time that I spoke with him and, and I checked in with his social workers uh, and they were also having difficulty finding him and investing an enormous amount of resources and trying to track him down and help pull him out of homelessness. Um, this story, I think, just elucidates a couple things. You know, number one, the eviction set off a spiral of negative events in Dave's life that had all sorts of consequences beyond just his housing situation. It had to do with his health, um, his ability to connect with a number of the other social services that were helping, just keeping him as an engaged member of the community, et cetera. Um, and additionally, there were a tremendous amount of resources that were poured into trying to keep Dave housed. You know, I was working on the case. He had multiple people from different agencies working with him. And as he deteriorated, we were investing even more resources into trying to help him out. But ultimately, like I said, there was no legal right that he could stand on. And so he ended up 
on the streets. Um, so uh, that's just one kind of personal story to, to give some color to what we're talking about. We, I know also many local jurisdictions, as well as that folks in the advocacy community are interested not just in these anecdotes, but in real hard data. And uh, data can be difficult to get a hold of in this realm related to addictions and displacement. At least in my office, in our service area, we've begun to try to solve for that problem by gathering data from our case records. And we just recently produced a report. Um, and if any of you want to follow up with me afterwards, I'd be happy to provide you with a copy of that. It's also available on our website. Just to give you a sense of what we've seen, I pulled out a few bullet points of some of the takeaways. You know, 75% of the evictions in the county that we worked on were either for non-payment of rent or there were no cause evictions. So three out of four folks who were being evicted were evicted either because they couldn't afford where they were living or through no fault of their own. Um, so that just gives you a sense of, you know, I think it, it helps to undermine this myth that most tenants are being evicted because they're uh, creating problems or they're terrible people, et cetera. Uh, a second interesting takeaway from our study was that we saw a more than 300% increase in no cause evictions over a three year period as the housing crisis, crisis worsens um, and we maintain those historically low vacancy rates, uh, landlords are really taking advantage of that to remove um, vulnerable tenants. And then this final bullet here highlights a lot of what Tristia was mentioning is that we actually did a preliminary follow-up survey partnering with some folks over at Stanford. And we found that over 17% of the tenants that we had helped through the eviction process ended up homeless in a three to 15 month time period afterwards. So the, the impact of being displaced seems to have a direct correl or, or I should say being evicted has seems to have a, a it's correlated at least with um, homelessness and the drag on social services that come with that. Uh, and I just have this last note here for those of you that haven't read Matthew Desmond's book. It's a great, very accessible uh, book that does provide some great data and storytelling to try to illuminate what many low income renters are facing um, in this country. So uh, I just would encourage you all to, to get your hands on that and give it a read when you got the chance. So we can move to the next slide. So uh, I'll go very quickly over this. You know, just in the framework for renter protections, I think of them as stability and savings. Uh, tenant protections are designed to keep current people in their homes. These are tenants who already have found a place to live that works for them. Um, and we're trying to prevent them from becoming homeless and uh, being required to access so many of these very expensive services. And then there's a number of other, as Tristia pointed out, um, externalities that flow from being evicted or being displaced. You know, children are pulled out of their schools in the middle of the school year and have to go through remedial programs which require greater resources, et cetera. Um, so, I'll just leave that where it is. We can move on to the next slide. So um, now entering a little bit more into the policy discussion, um, I can at least speak for the, the hot market that I practice in, which I think is emblematic of a lot of the, the tighter housing markets across the country, particularly near urban centers. Um, Displacement, is the two main drivers of displacement, at least in these areas, oftentimes are cost and evictions. So, you know, increasing rents, uh, stagnating wages, plus evictions. And so the two policies I'll be talking about are meant to address these two particular drivers of displacement. They're, they're tailored policy responses to the specific causes of displacement that we're observing in the market as it exists right now. And so, with respect to cost, the policy solution is some form of rent regulation. And with respect to evictions, one of the most effective strategies we've seen are what are called just cause for eviction laws. And so I'll walk through each of those separately. Um, with this slide here, I gave you the three big takeaways. If there's anything that you walk away from my, uh, my presentation with, I hope it's these three things. The first is that rent regulation is legal, at least at a federal level. However, there is a large asterisk to place near this, which is that really you need to do a state by state analysis. There are a number of states that have banned or limited 
rent controls or rent regulation. So depending on which state you're located in, it's important that you check in with your city attorney or county council to make sure that you're operating in available legal space to regulate. Um, the second main takeaway is that as, so long as you are in a state where you can have some form of rent regulation, there's a lot of space for flexibility and innovation. Um, there typically, there's no real federal regulation on rents and even in the states where you can have rent regulation, there's oftentimes no affirmative state legislation regulating rents. So it's really a matter for the local jurisdictions to address, which means that you can craft locally appropriate solutions. You do always have to be mindful of any limitations imposed by state law, but so long as you don't run counter to state law, there's a lot of different ways that you could craft a program to make it right for your community. What's right in New York City or right in San Francisco may not be right in the community where you're working. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't be thinking about rent regulation, it just means you should be thinking about how to do it in a way that works for you. Uh, and the third main point is that this is a very cost effective tool. So uh, these tools are proven to actually prevent displacement and help to alleviate homelessness in the cities that do have them. Uh, it's not a cure-all, certainly I don't want to say that you know, rent regulation and just cause is going to eliminate homelessness in your community. It is, it is one critical piece of a package of solutions, but it is a critical component. Um, and these policies can be crafted in a way where they have little or no cost to the local governments themselves, um, which means the cost savings can be large. So moving on to the next slide. Staying focused on rent regulation, I wanted to first open with a little bit of uh, history, which I know can be a little bit on the boring side, but trust me, it's important context for the policy debates that one often encounters when talking about rent control, just cause for eviction, et cetera. Um, so in terms of the, the evolution of rent regulation in the United States, scholars have divided the policies into two mainly two categories, first generation rent regulations and second generation. The first generation rent regulations really came out of the post-war era. Um, there were some strict rent controls in place after World War I and then particularly in World War II. And the first generation rent controls are characterized as typically strict price ceilings or price fixing. So the government would actually say, you cannot charge more than $1,000 for a studio apartment, or you cannot charge more than X for you know, a certain amount of square footage. Um, they were at least originally enacted as emergency measures during wartime, which explains the, the kind of um, the robust nature of the protections that they were offering and the strictness of the policy itself. The first generation rent regulations were oftentimes criticized, uh, particularly from economists and other folks who believe strongly in the value of the free market. Um, some of those criticisms were focused on the way that rent regulation could actually limit the supply of housing and therefore exacerbate housing shortages, which lead to the price, uh, the, the housing crisis in terms of affordability. Um, there were also many criticisms about the potential impact on the quality of housing. So the argument goes that if landlords can't get a good return on their property, they're not going to invest in actually maintaining those properties and we could see deterioration and blight. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of debate about how true some of those criticisms are, but it through those debates, there emerged a whole new generation of rent regulations. So one of my colleagues at Stanford often says, these are not your grandpa's rent control. Uh, this is second generation rent regulations are often referred to as rent stabilization. They typically don't involve setting strict price ceilings. Um, they're kind of a different way of approaching the affordability problem. Um, and they oftentimes bake in exemptions or um, other tailored accompanying policies to address specifically the criticism. So for example, you know, I mentioned two criticisms, the effect on housing supply and the effect on housing quality. So a lot of second generation rent regulations have essentially eliminated those concerns by doing things like, for example, giving an exemption on rent control for new construction. So, uh, anybody who wants to build housing can feel secure that they're going to be able to make the return that they desire 
and therefore they have not been disincentivized to actually continue to produce housing. So that's one way that you can uh, mitigate, if not completely eliminate, the concern that somehow this is going to diminish our housing supply. Um, similarly, many jurisdictions have enacted administrative remedies or administrative processes for tenants to address habitability violations. So if the landlords really do try to, uh, to or if the landlords refuse to maintain their properties up to health and safety codes, uh, oftentimes tenants won't go through the lengthy court process to get those issues addressed. Uh, but if there's a simpler, more streamlined, cost-effective administrative process, we found that tenants are much more likely to enforce health and safety codes themselves. And so tenants will actually play a primary role in enforcing the law and relieving some of that burden from the local governments and code enforcement officers. So uh, the, the key takeaway here is that you know, many of the criticisms I think that you'll hear of rent regulation really don't lead to a question of, well, do we do this or do we not do this? Is it good policy or is it bad policy? I think of them as questions of design. The issue is not do we do this or not, it's how do we do this in a way that is appropriate to the local community and is responsive to the particular conditions that we have on the ground. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I have this last bullet point, there's always politics. Uh, you know, this is a seen as a, an infringement on property rights and certainly you know the landlords and realtors and other folks in the real estate industry see rent regulation and just cause for eviction laws as a real problem um, and those lobby groups are very powerful in many locations and so you know I don't want you to think I'm sure that none of you do think that this would somehow be an easy lift um, you know politics always comes into play but you know, I do think looking at the, the evolution of these sorts of policies, we can see, well, a lot of the concerns that people raise, we actually have already addressed in some jurisdictions, or maybe we have the flexibility that we can um, respond to those concerns and craft a policy that will work here and not create all of the unintended consequences that people may be worried about. So moving on to the next slide. Um, so just a very quick 101 on the second generation form of rent stabilization. Um, essentially rent stabilization as opposed to strict price controls, it regulates the amount of rent increases for existing tenants. So it's not telling the landlord you can only charge $1,000 for a studio. The market will set the initial price. So a landlord and a tenant will enter into a lease, they'll agree to a particular price, but the price can only increase in a regulated amount. So as long as a tenant can afford the place when they move in, they have greater certainty about being able to afford the place as they move forward. Um, typically, the regulated rent increase is tied to inflation, though there's some variation in that. And just to give some examples, uh, or one example of some of the exemptions for a second generation type of rent regulation, uh, California is a state that permits rent regulation. It does have some state law that mandates the kind of second generation nature of any local law. So I have a, three points here that are true in California that could be used as models in other states if you were thinking about this. So the first is that there is an exemption for new construction. So if developers out there want to come into town and build new housing, they can do so without worrying that they're going to be subjected to rent control, which they think is a bad thing. And so this way the developers will continue to build. Um, this has been really effective in you know, places like San Francisco and even in New York where there are, um, we continue to see a lot of construction despite the fact that there are still rent regulations in place. Um, the second bullet point is what's called vacancy decontrol. It's a technical term, and essentially what that means is that you know the rent the rent regulation, rent stabilization only applies to a particular tenant as they live in their home. So uh, if you move out of your apartment, then the, when a new tenant moves in, the landlord and that new tenant will decide upon the rent. Essentially, it will be determined by the market, and then thereafter the rent increases will be regulated. Uh, so in a vacancy decontrol system, 
you have, a, I think of it as like a mixed market and regulatory approach. You have the market setting initial prices. There's a regulation on how much those prices can go up. But then there are periodic market corrections to the price as you have a natural turnover in units. Um, so it's a more moderate form of rent regulation. Uh, and then this third point is something that California did more just as a political matter. They exempted single family homes and condos. Uh, so, you know, the, a, a large portion of the voter base in many jurisdictions here as a, across the country are homeowners. Um, and one of the ways of getting some of the homeowners on board with these policies is to say, hey, look, you don't have to worry about this. We're going to get stability in our community. This law won't apply to you. It's really just going after um, commercial landlords who are different than your regular homeowners. Uh, and then the final point here is that in any rent regulation regime, and particularly the second generation ones, will have adjustments to ensure that landlords are able to make a fair rate of return and will typically include administrative processes to ensure that tenants can enforce their right to healthy and safe homes. Um, so if there is a landlord who believes that the rent regulation regime is depriving them of a reasonable rate of return, they can go and petition through this local process to try to make sure that there's an adjustment so that they're getting a fair shake. Um, so it creates procedural avenues to make case-by-case -case determinations to ensure that the law is not working in injustice. Um, you know, even though you have a blanket policy, there may be unique circumstances for individual landlords that would require variation, and you can just bake that straight into the policy itself. Uh, so that's the, the overview for rent stabilization. Uh, we can move on to the next slide and move on to just cause for eviction laws. Uh, just cause for eviction is typically seen as a complement to rent regulation and particularly in jurisdictions where you have second generation rent regulations that include things like vacancy decontrol. It's, it's actually a very important complement. So um, in California, for example, if a tenant is, if a tenant who's in a rent regulated unit leaves, the next tenant who comes in will pay market rate. Uh, that creates an incentive for landlords to evict all of their current tenants who are paying lower regulated rents so that they can bring in new tenants who are gonna pay higher rents. Uh, just cause for eviction prevents landlords from gaming the system in that manner so that they can't just evict tenants because they want to bring in some new person who's going to pay a lot more. So in that sense, they're kind of a, they work in a symbiotic nature to preserve housing. Uh, as with rent regulation, you, you always have to be careful that you're not stepping over the bounds of what your state law allows. Eviction laws more than even rent laws are, they vary widely from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and state to state. So you should always be working closely with your city attorneys and, and even any local legal aid offices uh, who can help you navigate that um, legal landscape to ensure that what you're doing will pass muster. Um, that being said, there are a lot of state law bans on rent control or rent regulation. Typically those bans do not also ban just cause for eviction. So even if you are in a state where you are not able to enact a rent regulation regime, you may yet still be able to pass just cause for eviction laws, and it won't be perfect relief for your renters, but it could be a meaningful step in the right direction to try to promote housing stability. So even if you feel like your hands are tied because the state says no rent control, um, we're here to tell you that you still have options. So we can move to the next slide. So um, it's important, I think, for just cause for eviction ordinances to understand what, what are they doing. In order to understand what they're doing, we have to understand what the current law is. And again, this varies greatly state to state. So I, there's a big caveat here that you, you need to make sure that you're working with city attorneys and local advocates to get this stuff right. But generally speaking, in most states, landlords are able to terminate month-to-month -month tenants or tenants who don't otherwise have a lease for any reason or for no reason with some limited exceptions. 
Um, so many people are surprised to learn that this is in fact the law. That tenants can be evicted even though they have done nothing wrong whatsoever. You pay your rent, you don't have extra people living there, you're taking care of the place, you're not having wild parties and bothering the neighbors, you can still be evicted. Even if you've lived there for 20 years and had a great relationship with the landlord up until then. In most states that is possible. So what just cause for eviction laws do is they turn that uh, default on its head and say instead of being able to be evicted for any reason or no reason at all, tenants can only be evicted if the landlord has a good reason. And typically there are two categories of reasons that you enumerate in this type of policy. Uh, there are fault reasons and no fault reasons. So fault reasons is you, you obviously as a tenant could still be evicted if you fail to pay the rent, if you breach your lease in a material way, you create a nuisance. Um, and then also no fault reason. So let's say the owner wants to move in or needs to renovate the unit to bring it up to code. Those would also typically be rationales that would allow a landlord to evict a tenant. Um, and I'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. We'll jump forward. I see we're a little short on time. So uh, I will summarize this last slide in terms of administration. The, the main takeaways here are that there's a lot of options available to local jurisdictions. There are a number of different approaches that jurisdictions that do have these programs have taken that range from very active, very uh, time and resource intense programs to very, you know, what are called passive enforcement ordinances that really don't require many resources at all from the local jurisdiction. And the final piece I would say is that even when they do require resources from local jurisdictions, typically these programs are actually financed through user fees. So it's not going to come out of your general fund or your general tax base. Uh, you can actually structure the financing of this program so that it's net zero on your budget. Um, and I will leave you with that. You can move to the next slide. My contact information is there. I'd be more than happy to chat with anybody offline um, if you're interested in exploring these policies further. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dan. We appreciate that. And now we will turn it over uh, to John Pollock. Just a note on the time. Uh, you have a lot of great content, um, as you have already heard. You're going to hear some more, so please do feel free to stay with us as uh, you hear from John on a right to counsel in housing cases. John, please take it away. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so if I can just be past control so that I can move the slides forward. Okay. Um, so thank you so much. I'm going to try to just um, sum up quickly what some, what's going on at the policy level with respect to right to counsel. Um, the most important thing you can take away from my comments today is our website, civilrighttocounsel.org, where a lot of the information I'm going to give you today is is available. Um, our coalition has three, about 300 participants in 38 different states, so there's a good chance we're working in your jurisdiction. Um, and we don't have a national strategy for how we approach right to counsel. It's entirely driven at the state and local level, both the state level and to some degree the local level increasingly as well. Um, I don't want to take a long time to just to talk about why the right to counsel in housing cases is important because I could spend all day um, making that argument, but um, besides the fact that we're talking about housing, which we consider a basic human need. Um, it's basically, <clears throat> there's a serious power imbalance in most housing cases. You're talking about tenants um, who are barely ever represented and landlords who are almost always represented. So basically systemic imbalance of power, which leads to uh, not really just results on a, on a systems level because the system sort of starts to adapt to the fact that only one side is represented typically. Um, there's also the fact that um, People don't generally believe in the legal system if they don't participate in it, if they don't feel like they could participate in it because they don't have an attorney. Um, and as we're going to talk about in a minute, there have been some increased um, findings about how providing counsel in housing cases would actually save money for cities and states, which I'm sure is of great interest um, on this call, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And lastly, um, some of the untreated housing matters eventually become public defender issues um, such as when people are evicted, become homeless, and then wind up in the criminal justice system, um, that makes a beleaguered 
public defense system even more beleaguered. So we basically see ourselves to some degree as a preventative, um, the right to counsel in housing cases as a preventative measure. Um, there's been a lot of data about the effectiveness of counsel. This slide has a, a lot more information than we have time to talk about it. So I just want to point to a couple of really um, sort of dramatic findings. If you look at the first column there, it says, um, in one study, basically, that even when compared not to people receiving no legal assistance at all, but even compared to people receiving limited scope assistance, so where they got some advice from an attorney but not full representation, that people with full help, with full representation, did twice as well as those who received limited representation. And the amazing thing is that in that study, the people who received counsel paid nothing to their landlords on average, zero dollars, compared to the people who got limited help who spent who had to pay their landlords over six hundred dollars. Um, so there, there's a lot we could talk about with effectiveness. I just want to leave you there to say that there's been there have been studies, there are still studies going on that we'll talk about in a minute that show that providing counsel has a dramatic effect on the outcome of the case and financial financially for the tenants at stake. The, what I want to talk to you a little bit about is the, the bills that are currently pending um, and what has been done around them. The big one that has received the most attention is New York City, um, a bill that has been pending for several years now, um, basically would provide counsel for all tenants in eviction proceedings in New York City. Um, originally, the bill would have aimed for people at 125% of the poverty level, and now it's 200%. Um, and um, it has an incredible base of support. The a veto-proof majority of the city council has already signed on to the bill. The city comptroller has come out and support the chief judge of New York, various borough presidents, the New York Times. Um, all of these sources have basically said this is something that needs to happen in addition to dozens of advocacy groups. The city council speaker and the mayor have not yet committed to the bill, but the city has invested $60 million in eviction defense. Um, and during that time has seen a, a significant decrease in the number of eviction filings um, that basically times up exactly with when more counsel started appearing in housing cases. Um, this, this story in Newsweek and this editorial in the New York Times are just some of the coverage that have happened um, about the, the bill in New York, which has, again, received a tremendous amount of, of um, coverage. Now, what a lot of people are interested in is how much is it, is, it, is it expected to cost in New York City? And this slide, again, has a lot of numbers on it. Um, but basically, what, what you should take away from it is that there were three different reports done in New York City about how much a right to counsel would cost. One was done by the city's independent budget office. One was done by the city council itself. And one was done by an independent financial analysis company that was contracted by the city bar. And amazingly, um, the, the reports are, are quite different from each other. This, this, the, City's independent budget office um, predicted it would cost anywhere from um, 100 million to 203 million per year. Um, the city council's um, finance committee predicted it would be 66 million, and SRR's report actually said that it would save 320 million dollars per year. Now you might wonder how could the numbers be that far apart? How could the IBO and SRR have such dramatically different takes on well, how much money would be saved? And one of the reasons is that. The um, independent budget office, when it looked at savings for providing a right to counsel, it looked primarily at shelter, um, avoiding shelter costs. And that is certainly a significant cost. But in New York City, which has rent stabilized and rent controlled units, when people are evicted from those units, those units are lost to the affordable housing pool and the city has to replace them. And it's more expensive to, to basically pay for new units than it is to retain the ones it already has in its housing stock. That was not taken into effect at all, into account at all by the IBO in its report. And the IBO also did not consider the costs for un, what we call unsheltered homeless individuals. So basically, when people are not going into the shelters but being on the street, what the, the, the law enforcement encounters, the health system encounters that they have, and so on, were not factored into the IBO report. Those are obviously big swings um, that can actually affect the numbers significantly. And also, um, SRR predicted that the number of families entering shelter due to eviction was much higher um, than the city um, IBO office thought it was. And so that obviously, the more people that are entering shelter due to eviction, the, the, the basically the, the more of an impact a right to counsel can have because it can stop um, people from entering the shelter if, if successful. And one of the things we often say is that when attorneys are involved, it's not just about – 
winning the quote winning the eviction case, even if the tenant is technically evicted, even if an eviction is entered, oftentimes the, the attorney, if someone has a right to counsel, can basically manage a soft landing for that tenant. They can ensure that they get the time they need to move out of the unit without having a homeless stretch. They can basically um, help with housing search services, help the tenant apply for housing subsidies, and so on and so forth. And those those are all things that can help person avoid shelter even if they are still technically evicted but without legal help many of those services they'll never receive and they may very well wind up in the shelter so in addition to the city there was also legislation last last couple of years at the state level we don't know in New York State we don't know yet if um, that bill is going to be filed again it was um, for both eviction and foreclosure and I should mention the New York City bill is also eviction and foreclosure but um, most of the focus has been on eviction because the belief is that not many homeowners um, would be income qualified for um, a right to counsel. So that the number, the impact of that part of it will be fairly minimal. Um, New, York's, um, New York's bill, as you can see here, it has um, some language on it. And one of the really nice things about the preamble of the bill is it says the housing crisis in New York City is a human rights crisis. So basically ties the, the right to counsel and the housing issue to human rights, which is, a, I think, an emerging and a really important angle for talking about this issue. Um, some of the figures for the New York State bill, um, it had compensation rates, the eligibility. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of debate about who was going to pay for it, um, and there was kind of a football bounce back and forth between different versions of the bill where it went from being a county slash city charge to a state charge to both to being a mixture of county and city um, and that you know question has not really been resolved yet and that um, you know is a question of course that comes up in um, in these jurisdictions whether the whether this should be a state level issue or a city level I can say that you know almost always a right to counsel is done um, at the it's passed at the state level but it's not you know unheard of that in some for some rights to counsel that exist already that counties do actually um, pay for those costs. And you, you, just to put this in context, there are many areas in the United States right now where there already is a right to counsel. Um, when people's children are removed by the state, when they're subjected to mental health proceedings, when their paternity is an issue, when their if the guardianship is being imposed, these are kinds of civil matters where most states already provide a right to counsel. So housing would not be the first right to counsel for a civil matter. It would be joining what we already have in many other areas. Um, the really exciting news, actually, this next slide shows a bill that literally just dropped uh, two days ago in Massachusetts, which was announced by the mayor of Boston, Mayor Kelly. Um, the state has actually had a bill pending to provide a right to counsel in eviction cases for um, the last couple of years, but this bill was actually basically driven by the mayor of Boston as opposed to, um, as opposed to just a state legislator. And what's really nice here, as you see in the in the header of the bill, it talks about it that the right to counsel is framed as homelessness prevention. That's basically how they see this issue, um, and and why there needs to be a right to counsel. Um, what's interesting about Massachusetts' bill is that it's a little different than the other ones in that the right to counsel would actually attach not when a person is sued in court, but actually the minute they get a, a notice to quit from their landlord. So it actually is intervening in the process even earlier which can actually be a fairly significant cost savings because the minute pleadings are filed with the court, then the court is basically spending money to basically manage the court process and it, if it never reaches the court in the first place, that can be a cost savings. Um, it's, that, that bill is limited to um, eviction. It reaches, um, now interestingly, as who would be eligible for counsel, it says 200% of the poverty level, yes, or receiving public benefits or what it calls unable to pay for an attorney without losing the necessities of life. This is a very unusual concept for a right to counsel bill, this very flexible idea of who would be eligible. Um, we don't know yet some of the details. We do know it would be state funded. We don't know who would be providing the legal assistance and the, the rest of the details. This bill was just dropped. There's a lot that still has to be worked out, but it's really exciting to see the bill being driven from the city level. The city, of course, of Boston has um, a lot of evictions, so it's understandable why they would be interested in this. Um, like other places, Massachusetts has done some studies to look at cost-saving potential. Um, there was a study done a couple of years ago, it's cited in the slide, which noted that um, in the state of Boston, there are 45,000, excuse me, in the state of Massachusetts, there are 45,000 evictions about it, 
about every year, um, and that fewer than 6% of tenants are currently represented. Um, that study noted what some of the costs are um, when people become homeless as a result of eviction, shelters, public health, foster care, policing, um, and then it, it basically ran some numbers and it basically said the total cost to represent all eligible beneficiaries in Massachusetts is 28 million, while the annual savings from representing this population is 76.252 million. In other words, for every dollar spent, um, the Commonwealth saves spends to save two dollars and sixty-nine cents. So basically, like the I like the report from SRR in New York, this report in Massachusetts saw it not actually costing money, but actually saving money when all of the cost savings are taken into account. That it would more than pay for itself, which is um, you know what the belief has been, but it's great to see this you know this sort of empirical work done to show that. Um, another bill that's currently pending in New York, in, excuse me, in D.C. Um, was dropped last year and was just reintroduced again this year. Um, it's basically to expand representation in housing cases. It's not a right to counsel per se, but the bill basically says we want to build towards a right to counsel, and the way we're going to get there is starting to ag aggressively expand housing representation. And it, it limits it to certain kinds of cases that it that it considers to be the most important ones, um, which are which are listed here on the scope of slide. Um, things like besides evictions, affirmative code violations, housing subsidy terminations, and so on. Um, and lastly, um, San Francisco, which um, passed an ordinance a, a number of years ago saying we want to be the first right to counsel city in the country. Um, then basically created a pilot to provide housing representation. It funded this pilot through city funds, and it provided full scope representation in 117 cases and limited scope in 692. And it basically concluded that when people got full representation, which is what a right to counsel would be, that basically they were more likely to stay in their homes than if they just got limited assistance. And that they basically estimated that through the through the provision of services in this project that there were cost savings of about $1.1 million, um, which was, again, this is a very small project, relatively speaking, but still a very significant cost savings that were perceived to, to be possible. Um, what is also going on, this slide here shows you that um, there are pilots, research pilots going on right now that are, that are currently measuring, continuing to measure the impact, the exact impact of providing counsel, both in terms of outcomes and cost savings. California is engaged in a massive effort um, it has been for the last four or five years to um, study interventions in eviction, um, among other things, and it's going to be releasing a report this year um, with the first results of what the effect of providing counsel and helping cases has been. Um, we're really looking forward to that, and what's interesting is that these pilots have been funded um, by private sources like foundations, by state, fund, um, state funding, um, and by city funding. So basically, um, interest at the municipal level and the state level in providing housing representation and saying, you know, if we did systemize this, if we provided it as a right, what, what benefit could we hope to see back? How would this benefit, you know, in terms of justice and in terms of the financial bottom line? So that's all I want to say today. Um, I just want to point you towards a couple of resources. If you want to know what the latest going on around the country is, including all of the stuff I just told you, if you go to civilrighttocouncil.org, you'll see this interactive map. Um, Right now it's showing the recent activity view, which any state that's orange is basically a state where something's happening. And if you were to click on a state, it would pop up a little box telling you what currently is happening. You could read more about that effort. Um, if you wanted to know what states provide a right to counsel in you know, certain kinds of areas, whatever the civil area you're interested in, you can choose right to counsel status. Here I've got a, a map showing you, for instance, for housing discrimination, it's showing you which states have law relating to appointing counsel and housing discrimination cases. You can click on one of those states and see the details. Um, and we also have a bibliography which has all of our research on right to counsel. Um, in, in housing areas, you can see here it's broken out by eviction, foreclosure, and so on. And we, all of the studies and reports that have been done that you saw in my pr presentation, plus all of the news stories, all the law review articles, and so on, all of that is contained on our website. Um, and we update that regularly. And lastly, there are some great resources about why people, people who have written about why there should be a right to counsel, why it's a justice issue, why it's a human rights issue, why it's an economic issue, and so on. Um, and I encourage people to um, have a look at those. Those are all in our bibliography. But basically, the bottom line is when it comes to homelessness, criminalization of homelessness, prevention of homelessness, basically providing, providing a right to counsel 
um, is one of the best ways to basically ensure that basically the only the people who should be evicted are evicted, and that even if even eviction is the right thing, that basically people can avoid becoming um, becoming homeless and then you know basically incurring the cost that basically society pays in a variety of different ways depending on how they encounter our social um, safety net and and the rest. So we we have the data. You see increasingly it, it's being approached as a policy issue at the city and state level and we're really excited to talk to people who want to bring this to their jurisdictions as a policy approach. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so very much, John, and also to Dan for your fantastic presentation. Uh, you received a lot of information today, uh, and I'm sure that you will have some questions. Uh, we are going to do the feedback poll, um, but I'll just notify everyone right now that since we're over time, we're going to forego the question and answer period. If you do have questions, please feel free to email them to the uh, presenters today. If it's easier, you can email them directly to your contact at the National Law Center, and we'll ensure that your questions are answered by the appropriate presenter. Thank you very much for attending today, and please uh, stick with us for just one more moment in our quick poll. Janelle? Yes, thanks everyone. Uh, so a couple of folks have voted already, but um, for those that haven't, please take just one quick moment to respond to our poll that's on your screen right now. We would just like to know if the information that you learned today in this webinar will help you achieve the goals um, that, uh, that come from the Data-Driven Justice Initiative um, in your community. And we would just like to know if you agree with that or disagree with that or if it doesn't uh, necessarily apply to your situation. So uh, if you haven't yet, please do take just a second to respond to that poll for us. And um, after you've responded, as Tristia noted, you can um, you know, send questions or feedback or um, request for additional information to any of the presenters or um, you know, to us here at the Law Center. So thank you, everyone, for, um, for participating in the poll. And I will put the contact information for our presenters back on the screen. And back to Tristia. Thank you very much, everyone. You have our contact information here. This webinar was recorded. It'll be available on the Law Center's website. Please do contact us with any questions about the information you learned today or to learn more about the topics presented on today. There will be another webinar coming up from the Law Center as part of our DDJI webinar series. Uh, that will take place sometime in March, so please be on the lookout for that. And thank you all very much for attending today. Have a great afternoon.